It's chemistry cooking. To start off making your pasta, you're going to whisk together flour and salt in a bowl. You then pour it onto a clean surface and you make a well into the center of it and crack your eggs into that. Then mix until a dough forms and knead for about 5 minutes. Pasta as a substance works because it's made up of two starches, one sticky one and one non-sticky one, and protein from the eggs. The starches are amylopectin and amylose. Amylopectin is to ensure that the different ingredients come together fluently, meaning it binds together what would otherwise be stringy. Amylopectin is what is used for structure in the pasta because it is a branched molecule, but uh, amylose is a linear one, but both are made up of chains of the fami familiar molecule glucose. We're not going to mention how bad I am at kneading apparently, but what we are going to mention is gluten networks. Both now and earlier when the pasta was being kneaded were important to the process in the sense that gluten networks were being formed through the movement of the dough. The gluten ne networks are formed from two proteins, gliadine and glutenin, which combine to form these gluten networks. These proteins are able to get into place and bond with each other to form proper networks while the dough is being kneaded. During this process, the gluten molecules also become elastic and later help the dough to swell while being cooked. This is why so many gluten-free products are crumbly, because the gluten is the main part of holding the starches together. Here you can see that gluten is composed of two types of proteins, as were stated earlier, and the network that is formed when these proteins come together. Continue to knead until the dough is no longer sticky. So this next step is optional, but I really want my ravioli to be very fall-like. So I'm going to be splitting my dough into two balls and dyeing one of them orange with food coloring. In order to do this, drop the dye onto the pasta and knead it until it is evenly distributed. Food coloring is an interesting molecule in the sense that it must be made up of at least one chromophore and a conjugated system in an organic compound. This is what allows it to give color to other things as chromophores can absorb light, can absorb certain wavelengths of light, and therefore can adapt certain colors on the visible light spectrum, which is shown here. Chromophores are called complex atoms because they are different from regular ones in the sense that their d orbitals are split into two different energy systems. This is important because it's what allows them to absorb photons into a higher energy level in order to take on that light from the spectrum. When the photon is absorbed into the different d orbital and the higher energy level, the wavelength of light and a color change is the result. Next, just wrap your dough up tightly in plastic wrap and place it into the fridge for an hour. While we wait, we'll prepare our filling. To make the filling, we'll simply combine butternut squash puree, parmesan, ricotta, and brown sugar, then season with salt and pepper. The substance that we've just made is a heterogeneous mixture because, as you can see, the elements within are not completely mixed together and dissolved within each other. If we had applied heat to the mixture, the cheese and sugar would have melted and fully combined with the puree. That was a daunting wait. But now it's time to shape our pasta and fill it. Start by taking your ball of dough and rolling it out into a sheet and placing it on a flat surface. The rolling out of dough is a physical change, not a chemical one. During this process, no aspect of the elemental makeup of the dough is changing, meaning no bonds are breaking or being formed. Instead, the physical appearance of the dough is the only thing being changed. This could be considered a chemical change if bonds between the gluten proteins were forming, 
but at this point, you should have already had all of those. Once completely rolled out, like mine is here, take a small amount of filling and place it onto the dough about one inch apart from each other. I'm using a half of a tablespoon here to do this. When you're ready, place a the other sheet of dough on top of that one and cut around it to make small squares. Place the edges of these squares down with a fork to ensure that the ravioli doesn't break open during the boiling. Repeat this process until you have no more dough left to do it with. Once your raviolis are all set to go, you can either freeze some for later or cook it now, which is what I'm going to be doing. To start cooking, boil a pot of water and add in just a dash of salt. The salt is going to completely dissolve into the water because the bonds of the salt molecules, or NaCl, are going to be pulled apart by the H2O molecules, which have a stronger bond. Because of the raised heat and therefore kinetic energy of the molecules, they're moving faster. The bond between salt molecules are unlikely to reform and will instead be surrounded and dissolved by the water molecules. Once you're sure it's boiling, dump your ravioli into the pot and wait for them to float so you know they're completely done, stirring occasionally. Remember those starch molecules we were talking about earlier? Well, this is where amylose really comes into play. Because amylose is insoluble, it is a big part of what keeps the pasta from dissolving when it cooks, and rather causes it to be nice and firm. When its temperature is raised above 65 degrees Celsius, it gelatinizes. Gelatinization is a chemical reaction in which starch combined with moisture and heat is thickened. The granules in the starch swell, which is why pasta comes out thicker when it is cooked along with the absorption of the water in the pot. Gelatinization is called a thermoirreversible reaction because the molecules do not melt upon heating, which allows the pasta to cook rather than dissolve or melt. Here you can see the difference between a frozen ravioli and a cooked ravioli. See how much bigger the cooked one is? Because too much heat results in the degrading of granules rather than their displacement and a loss of that thickening. In this diagram you can see the difference between raw starch, a swollen granule, and a completely degraded one, 